Let's start with the recent interview of Vladimir Putin with Tucker Carlson, in which he was pointing out something so special about the presidents of the United States. There are people behind the scene who are deciding about what the president can do and what president cannot do. Are these guys CIA or it's beyond that? I, I think there's a lot to it. Uh, and, 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 you know, thanks again for having me back on. Um, it's a lot to it. Some of it is very mundane, right? Some of it is, this is what happens in an entrenched bureaucracy. This is what happens when you have people who've been in positions for years and they know they're going to remain in those positions and they can just wait out the uh, people who have been <clears throat> put into power through, say, elections. Uh, they can just wait them out, right? And so you've seen that occur over and over again in all fields of government. Uh, you know, it certainly happened in the military. Uh, you know, it, you know, if, it, it, when I was in the Marine Corps, you'd hear um, officers grumbling about having to work with civilians because those civilians stayed in those jobs and those positions forever, right? So uh, an officer might be in that billet, as we call it, that job for 18 months or, or two years. And so if the civilian who was underneath that officer didn't like what was going on or what the officer's plans or priorities were. They just had to slow roll things. And eventually that officer would be moved someplace else. And so I think that you see that, you know, in bureaucracies, uh, in governments throughout the world. And I think you uh, have that understanding uh, with particularly the foreign policy establishment in the United States. Uh, you know, it's certainly not as mundane as other uh, bureaucracies or, or governments, uh, but it certainly is something that uh, exists in that manner. Uh, what you what makes it so especially significant or so powerful is that you have a common mentality towards foreign policy in Washington, D.C. that extends through both major political parties. So there is what's called basically, it's called the blob, uh, this foreign policy consensus. And it's the foreign policy consensus of empire. You know, it shouldn't be surprising. And so the idea that you have a president who is going to do something that is antithetical to the interests of the foreign policy establishment of the empire, well, that establishment is going to do everything it can to prevent that from happening. And some of it is either sabotage, some of it is insubordination. Some of it's just slow walking. And the example that comes to mind right now is when Donald Trump ordered U.S. troops out of Syria. Now, he didn't he didn't go through with it fully. He ordered the repositioning of troops. But what happened, according to Ambassador James Jeffrey, who at that point was the uh, president's uh, person in charge of the Syrian war, uh, Je Ambassador Jeffrey, a man who I knew 20 years ago at the State Department, uh, he is on record as saying, we denied the president. We defied him. The president wanted to pull troops out of Syria, and we didn't do it, right? So you, you, this happens continually. It, it's, uh, you know, you also had it in this presidency uh, in the first year or two uh, when the White House said, hey, look, any drone strikes have to go through us. You know, we are we are pulling back on the drone strikes, which is a credit that the White House does deserve uh, amongst all the things that they deserve very great deals of criticism for. They do deserve some credit for pulling back the drone assassination program. Uh, so the, <clears throat> the the White House said any drone uh, strikes need to be cleared through the White House and the CIA and the military continued to do the drone strikes. This should have been a, a major crisis. This should have been a situation where uh, uh, people were relieved and possibly gone to jail because of the defiance of the White House on this. Uh, what they did was they said, well, these drone strikes were in self-defense, so we didn't have to go to the White House, which was complete, complete uh, nonsense. It's fabrication. It's just a way of excusing their actions by claiming self-defense. So this is this is something what Putin was talking about, how he had this relationship with these presidents, but then behind the scenes, uh, subordinate levels, uh, the, the, the people who control the details, who make things happen, uh, you know, either slow walked it or, 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 or blocked it or sabotaged it. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's something that we shouldn't be surprised by. And this is the root of the idea of the deep state. 
And particularly since the Trump presidency, the idea that deep state has taken on uh, really uh, uh, sinister and nefarious overtones. Uh, and, you know, this idea that there is uh, this cobble uh, that is guiding American foreign policy, guiding the empire that is untouched by the political system. Uh, you know, the, the idea, though, that supports such uh, a, a, a reality that there is a deep state, uh, ignoring the, the say, the, the uh, uh, hyperbole and exaggerations that have occurred over the last years with that term, but just to use that term because it's easy to use right now. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's something that, how can you deny it? Uh, one, there is this idea, as we discussed earlier, about entrenched bureaucracy. Uh, but then also, too, you're talking about a national security state, a war machine that receives <clears throat> about $1.4 trillion a year so there's not going to be some type of 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 uh, of inertia that is associated with such a leviathan that just the, the nature of it, the size of it, the scope of it, how much it has in terms of resources, how much is it funding, uh, how widespread it is, there isn't going to be that type of inertia that prevents anything from being changed. I mean, so that's just the I think something that we have to recognize that we're up against is the. Uh, is the reality of the Leviathan that is the national security state, that is the war machine. How these guys can keep their people in the governments doesn't matter if it's Donald Trump or Biden. Can't remember who said it, but I've heard, I've, uh, who said it first, but it's being repeated now. And folks who are watching have probably heard, uh, you know, Larry Wilkerson say it and, and, and others uh, that, you know, uh, whoever you elect as president of the United States, you end up getting John McCain. Um, and one of the one of the aspects of it is what we were just talking about, this inertia, this the fact that this is the consensus of the foreign policy establishment of the empire, uh, how they keep their people in it is this gets into the actual mechanics of the military industrial complex, how it operates, how it works. One of the things it does is it funds all these think tanks throughout Washington, D.C. And last year, um, the Quincy Institute, which is one of the few non-military industrial complex allied think tanks in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, studied this. And they found that, you know, the, the, the top think tanks, you know, 50 of them uh, take money from the weapons industry. And so these think tanks, as well as, of course, weapons companies, development firms, you know, so firms that are, are, are that do uh, uh, uh humanitarian assistance, you know, because that all has been militarized. So the whole idea of all these companies that work with USAID, the State Department's uh, development arm, um, which is billions and billions and billions of dollars a year, uh, they're all part of the military industrial complex. So in addition to these corporations, you have these think tanks that serve as holding pens, basically. So when your party is out of power, you can go to the American Enterprise Institute, you can go to Heritage, you, and they'll have a spot for you until, you know, your party's back in the White House. And then you can go back into uh, the, uh, you know, you can go back into the State Department or to the Department of Defense or the National Security Council. And the same thing when the Democrats are out of power, they can go to uh, they can go to uh, Brookings or Center for American Progress or Center for New American Security. I mean, uh, there's just you know dozens of these organizations. They also serve as a rotational uh uh, base basically again it's like a holding pen for people who go in and out of the capitol uh, out of congress so you have hundreds and hundreds of, of staff members in congress thousands uh in congress and hundreds of them work on uh defense issues on national security issues on intelligence issues and so what they do is the military industrial complex does this part of the empire does is that it makes sure that it's rotating its people into Congress just as it's rotating its people into the executive branch. So these staffers who are working particularly, say, on the Armed Services Committee, the Intelligence Committee, the Foreign Relations Committees, uh, they are uh, they have the pedigree, they have the the, the views, uh, they have the background that the military industrial complex wants. And those then are the people who are writing the laws. Those then are the people who are drawing up the amount of money to be appropriated to the Defense Department, right? Those are the people who 
who authored this, uh, you know, as we're talking today, this morning, uh, the Senate approved that $95 billion in funding for Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. Well, though, if you go and you look and pull it apart, I'm guaranteed you find that the people who actually authored that, who wrote that, who typed the keys on the keyboard, all have these types of backgrounds we're talking about. So that's one way that it maintains uh, the, its people, how it keeps it so that the folks who are uh, populating both the executive and the legislative branch are uh, the people that the military industrial complex wants there. And that continues that type of group think, that continues that consensus, that continues the narrative of empire that makes it so that even if you were to elect uh, you know, uh, 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 Alan Omar or Alexander, Alexander Castro Cortez or uh, Rand Paul or anyone to the office of president, how much could they actually change? Because the whole system has just been infused with loyal servants of just, not just the empire, but of the military industrial complex. There were two key moments that Putin was talking about in this interview. The first was his suggestion to Bill Clinton about joining NATO. And the other was having just a unified missile defense system together with the United States and Europe. If you go toward a direction that you are going to have some sort of partnership, then you you may find some ways to decrease the tensions between the states. The other thing that he mentioned in terms of the relationship between Russia and China was the compromise and cooperation. It seems to me that still in the United States, they don't see the necessity of compromise when it comes to Russia or China, doesn't matter. Right. And they the same concept. And finally, the compromise would lead to cooperation. If there is no compromise, no cooperation comes along. What's your take on this? It, the first aspect of that, Nima, with regards to this idea that we could have cooperated with the Russians, they could have joined NATO, there could have been a, a, a unified missile defense system, uh, you know, is that the uh, empire doesn't want to have equals. So the United States does not want to have an equal partner in anything. It wants to be in charge. It wants to be in control. And to bring the Russians with, particularly when you're talking about, say, a missile defense and talk about NATO, with the, with the Russians' military capabilities and in particular Russia's nuclear uh, capabilities, well, that would make the Russians uh, equal uh, of the United States. It, it, they, you know, there would be no way the Americans could lord over uh, NATO if Russia was in it. It wouldn't just be, uh, you know, a, an appendage of the American empire. It wouldn't be, it, let alone the Russians would not act as the loyal, uh, you know, vassal states that most NATO members act as. So it was just never going to be a possibility because of the reality of the American empire and, and the ability, I mean, you had this from, from you know, the, the, the way that the Americans want to have leverage and power over everyone. Some of it is political. It's good to have an adversary. It's good to have somebody that you can juxtapose yourself against, particularly a foreign enemy. Uh, we all know that's been used for, 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 for eons by those in power to distract their public away from the from the, the problems at home. Look at the look at the dangers overseas, you know, or across the border. So, you know, the the uh, desire for the United States to have that unipolar hegemony, right? Particularly so in the 90s, the desire to 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 really capitalize on what the end of the Cold War had brought. That, you know, so what you saw was uh, particularly the Clinton administration jettisoning uh, anything the George H.W. Bush administration had done towards creating some type of multipolar or cooperative or non uh, he uh, hegemony. Uh, you know, the Americans wanted to win. We won. We reaped the rewards. We need to win further. There's more we can win. Right. We need to to solidify our gains. We need to capitalize them. And if the Russians don't want to go along with us, then, you know, as Joe Biden said about 24 years ago, Joe Biden, in, in, when discussions were going on about NATO expansion and Russian opposition, uh, Joe Biden is on record as saying, what are they going to do about it? 
you know, and a twist of, of, of fate looking looks uh, is quite humorous as we talk about it now. At that point, Joe Biden said, what are the Russians going to do about it? They can go be friends with the Chinese or the Iranians. Right. And here we are where that's the world we are in. Uh, you know, I mean, so uh, they're, they're, the idea of having this cooperation with Russia, of having some type of, uh, of platform devoted towards, uh, uh, you know, organization devoted towards uh, unity, uh, towards, you know, improving uh, 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 cooperation among nations, uh, leading to a better world, a more just and peaceful world, was never in the interests of the Americans. I mean, and the Americans will say our missile defense program in particular, it's meant to stop rogue states. It's not meant to uh, stop, you know, with, it's not geared towards Russia. The Russians have nothing to worry about it you know, complete, uh, completely absurd. You know, I mean, the, 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 the missiles in Poland are supposed to be for Iran, according to the Americans officially, right? So complete nonsense. Everyone sees through it. But, you know, by bringing the Russians into something like that, that completely calls that bluff. It also eradicates the entire, per it eradicates the entire purpose of the American missile defense program, which is to dominate Russia, which is to have leverage over Russia, which is to be military superior over Russia and be able to blackmail Russia with our first strike uh, nuclear capabilities, which have just every decade grown uh, uh, greatly. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think... <clears throat> You know, this idea of of seeing compromise that you're then talking about, that aspect of, of, of compromise uh, by the Americans, it's just not in the nature of empire to do that. The empire has the right to whatever it wants. That's how it feels. And that's how those who populate it feel. Who is anyone else to make demands on the Americans? I mean, you can see it with just this, you know, this continual assertion by both uh, those in the executive branch and and members of Congress, uh, as well as all those, their apologists and the pundits and the cheerleaders on cable news, uh, this idea of a rules-based international order that don't speak to us about international law. We have a rules-based international order. I mean, so just the whole double standard of it, the hypocrisy of it, the the just the illogic of it, uh, right. I mean, so that's the type of of, of 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 mindset and beliefs that the empire comes to when it's dealing with other nations. It, we have a right to do as we want. It's our rules based international order. Uh, so, uh, you know, the other thing that 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 makes this uh, even more complicated or, 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 or makes the problem deeper is that. The American mindset going into this is also all political. It's not cooperative at all. It's all political. So when you see who are uh, the uh, uh, members of the American foreign policy elite, those who are representing the United States diplomatically, those who are in the White House, those who are oftentimes at the Defense Department, uh, you know, and then, of course, even our, our diplomats, our ambassadors, many of them are our ambassadors are uh, uh, those who raise the most money for their presidential campaigns. So highly partisan figures as well. So what you see then, and you can see this, say, with someone like a Jake Sullivan, right, is that someone who comes with only a political background. So everything they see is through the lens of a political campaign. And that means everything is binary. That means everything is zero sum. And that's their whole background. That's the context in which they see the world in. How could these people see it any other ways? This has been their entire life has been political campaigns. And so whether it is somebody in their congressional district, uh, in a primary or general election race, or it's or if it's the head of state in a nuclear armed country, they view it with the same lens of this is a political contest, me versus them. There's only going to be one winner in this and I'm going to be it. And I mean, so I, I think that's that's that combines with the realities of the American empire, which is the same of, as the realities of all previous empires. And this is why you have this position where there is no cooperation. There is no uh, desire for compromise. Uh, we don't see negotiated settlements. We see might makes right. And because the United States is an incompetent and failing empire, almost always we have seen the United States on the losing side of that might makes right.
this type of behavior that you were talking about, we can say it is the product of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because before the collapse of the Soviet Union, we remember Kennedy had some sort of compromise between the United States and Soviet Union for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm. And since the collapse of the Soviet Union, as the United States was the sole superpower, they were deciding about everything that they didn't care about what Russia wants, what China wants, what the other countries want. Right now, it seems that the world is changing. It's not the way that it was. In your opinion, are we getting to that point that the United States would learn to compromise? Is that possible? Well, it certainly is possible. And I think most of us would like to see that. I'd certainly like to see that. I, I especially would like to see a uh, refocusing on international institutions and international law. Uh, as a means of of addressing conflict between nations, but also to cooperation. You know, we have a host of challenges in this world, uh, whether they be nuclear weapons, whether they be climate change, whether they be uh, uh, poverty and food scarcity. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly uh, the uh, dangers of artificial intelligence, which people like to talk about. I mean, all these things are things that we must uh, work through, manage and resolve cooperatively because they span borders and there's no way that one nation can can control the uh, uh, resolution of those issues on its own. It's just simply not possible just based on the reality of those issues. Uh, but United States, and again, getting back to these twin aspects of decision making the the inertia of the empire what the empire is going to do because it's an empire basically uh and the the, the political nature of american decision making makes it so that uh giving up or ceding any power is anathema to the empire so any type of compromise means uh you know that that the empire has lost and in the same way too the politicians who inhibit who inhabit uh, these positions of power in the United States, who are the decision makers, uh, anything that does not make them look good in the moment. Uh, so even if it is like the best thing in terms of mid or long term, in the moment, if it does not make them look good, if they cannot sell it and spin it as a victory for themselves, they don't want anything to do with it. So it, I think what you're going to continue to see is this stubborn refusal by the United States to accept uh, how poorly uh, it has managed its position as the world's uh, hegemon over the last 30 years. Uh, the refusal, the stubborn refusal to understand that this reality is a reality of the United States is making. That's what's occurring in the world with these wars and conflicts and instability is a reality of American foreign policy. That militarized foreign policy of the U.S. Uh, has, be, for, for again, both the purposes of empire and for uh, uh, political reasons, has brought about this incredibly unstable world that is full of conflict. Uh, you know, there's a refusal to accept that. Uh, and then there's, there's the idea of seeding anything, of, of, of perhaps not being in a position that you were uh, previously, so that you are, uh, you own less, that the United States has less territory on the map than it did when you came into power. And now you start getting into the whole arguments of, you know, this goes back to the 1950s and the who lost China, right? Which is what kept, say, LBJ in Vietnam. He, he said, I mean, LBJ, there's a, if people haven't read this interview that Bill Moyers did with LBJ back in, uh, I guess it was 65 or 66, he talks about how, you know, I know this war in Vietnam is lost. Uh, it can't be won. But if I say that, those guys in Congress are going to hang me, right? And it's a whole who lost China thing. And then, of course, that's what, you know, keeps, uh, say, Barack Obama in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, he's, he's, this uh, resurgence of the Islamic State in 2012, 2013, 2014 prevents the withdrawal of the United States from Afghanistan because Obama lost Iraq. He can't be seen as losing uh, uh, Afghanistan as well. I mean, now, of course, you see that with the charges against Joe Biden in a sense of Joe Biden lost Afghanistan. Uh, so the fear that anything you do, even if it makes strategic sense, even if it is strategically wise and, 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 and provident, fruitful thing to do, 
uh, if it is not able to be spun and sold uh, on the current news cycle of that day, then it cannot be uh, accepted as a course of action by uh, the American administration. And so we, we have this conundrum where we can see this, uh, what's the expression about, you know, watching a train wreck in slow motion. And we can see, we've, we've seen what has occurred because of this uh, militarized foreign policy in the United States, the decision making of both Republican and Democratic administrations. And we can see where that's going. We can see how we got there here. We can see how we got here and we can see where we are going with it. And yeah, it, it's terribly frightening. Uh, it, it really is. And uh, I, I think that the horrors that we're witnessing, whether they be in Ukraine or in uh, Gaza, uh, I think, unfortunately, will be uh, superseded by hor horrors to come in the next five or 10 years because of the uh, United States refusal to accept that its decision making has called these things. I mean, if you go back 10 years ago, say, uh, the height of, uh, of, of what was happening in the Syrian war. Uh, you know, then 2015, 20, I, I think we would say, my God, will we see anything worse than what we're seeing in Aleppo or Raqqa right now? You know, go back five years to what we saw happening in, uh, you know, as as the Islamic State was destroyed in Mosul, you know, as that was finally finished five years ago. Wow, will we ever see something like this again? And now, of course, we're seeing that occurring in both Ukraine and in Gaza, plus in numerous other conflicts around the world that uh, uh, are, you know, whether it be Sudan or Ukraine, certainly all throughout Africa, that have American fingerprints on them, in whether they be corporate or government fingerprints. How do you see the position of Netanyahu right now? How do you see the outcome of his actions? Very tenuous, right? I mean, he is incredibly unpopular. Uh, although the war, uh, from the Israeli perspective, is still popular. Uh, but <clears throat> yeah, the best thing I, I've seen, Nima, and I recommend people to look at this, is is just uh, today or yesterday, uh, Moody's uh, credit rating agency downgraded Israel, uh, dropped them from an A1 to an A2. Uh, and the, their justification, their write-up, uh, discussing why they made that decision, uh, the risk inherent in Israel's future is one of the best write-ups I've read about this, about the dangers to come to Israel. Uh, and they, they look at this in an economic and a political lens. And I think that's what you see here with this mistakes uh, and, uh, of, of, of Netanyahu. And I shouldn't say mistakes, they're really crimes. Uh, but his desire to hold on to power it was... The way he, he he chose to proceed with that was co-joined with this desire to fulfill the promises of having a greater Israel, of fulfilling the Zionist project, right? So we have our opportunity here for Netanyahu. It was, I have an opportunity, one, to stay in power because I'm incredibly unpopular. Uh, they are trying to remove me from office for good cause. I mean, people remember, go back, uh, you know, just a month or so before uh, the October 7th attacks. You had a million Israelis out in the streets uh, because the, you know, whose government and he himself was so corrupt uh, and they were trying to change uh, the way the government worked in Israel, uh, particularly reforming, if you want to call it that, gutting uh, the judicial a uh, 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 part of the government uh, so that the legislature could do basically whatever it want without any type of judicial constraint. Um, so October 7th provided the opportunity for Netanyahu to sweep that away, right? I mean, this, this, this attack on Israel was used in a way to rally the people together of Israel, to bring, to unify them. It was a way to make sure that you're in a, a state of national emergency where you can't consider removing the government right now. We are in a state of national emergency. And it go, and it is the best opportunity Israel has had. Uh, in my lifetime, to carry out this ideal of a greater Israel, to particularly finish the Gaza problem. So Netanyahu's calculations in the short term, I think, were, were astute, were correct. And we see that. And we see him have a compliant American Congress behind him, 
uh, a White House that is grumbling and saying he's an asshole and things like that, but still shipping him three C-17s worth of bombs every day, right? I mean, so as well as the fact that he's going to get billions more in U.S. assistance. You know, one thing I learned from reading the Moody's report to, today about Israel was that, and I didn't know this, the United States has a loan guarantee to Israel. So any loan that Israel applies for, the United States is an automatic co-signer. So that's the same as you or I going for a, a, a loan for a car or for a house and having Elon Musk as our co-signer, right? We can get whatever we want. <laughs> you know I, mean? Right? I mean, so so I mean, like, I, I did not realize, and this goes back decades, actually, that the United States had that type of agreement with Israel to be their loan guarantor. So he has the support of the world's reserve currency behind him. Whether or not he has the ability uh, with everything that's going on, with with with, with the, the, the inability to get the hostages back, with the dangers of a northern front, with the West Bank ready to explode, uh, you know, the, the genocide in Gaza doesn't seem to be, which is horrifying, doesn't seem to be bothering too many Israelis which is, you know, really, really horrifying. But, uh, you know, with, with those other aspects, with the um, economic bleed out occurring in Israel, uh, the, and the, 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 does Netanyahu have the political ability to survive? And as everyone knows, there's been plenty of times when people have said, that's it, Netanyahu's done. And then, hey, guess who's prime minister of Israel again? I mean, so is he going to be able to have the ability to get through this? He has options in the sense of, uh, he, but it, those options also have uh, pitfalls. Uh, so he can continue to align himself with uh, the far right government, uh, you know, with, with the, the Ben Gavirs and the Smotrices, so the extremists, the settler class, uh, and <clears throat> keep the government afloat that way. Uh, essentially making a deal with the devil, though, uh, or he could uh, bring the opposition into the government uh, if he wants to end this war in Gaza, if he wants to get the hostages back. He makes a deal with the opposition. Yair Lapid comes into to power with him and, and the others. And, um, you know, a hostage deal, a, 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 a deal is brokered with Hamas that makes the right wing that is his government right now, freak out, but he's basically switched sides here uh, to a degree. I shouldn't say switch sides. He's trying to, to utilize the centrists uh, to keep himself in power. And so you can see how this is all very, uh, uh, you know, it's this juggling act, right? This, this, this political uh, shuffling that, that can be occurring, this gamble. And so how he manages it, we'll, 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 be, we'll see. Uh, he certainly uh, is a believer uh, in greater Israel, though. And so I would expect that he is not going to take that offer to uh, align himself or to bring into the government uh, the, 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 the parties uh, in opposition. Uh, but I think he's going to try and find a way to fulfill his, his commitment to greater Israel keep the right wing in power, uh, bank upon the support of the United States, and then maybe a, a northern front or possibly, you know, a third intifada in the West Bank uh, is the way that he maintains a national emergency, which prevents a dissolution of the government, but also, too, uh, provides for a unifying uh, a unifying factor among the Amer Israeli, uh, Israeli public, because uh, Netanyahu will continue to say he's the only one that can bring Israel through to victory. And I mean, it is, I think one of the things you have to note is every paragraph, everything Netanyahu states, every third or fourth sentence, he uses the word victory. And I think he understands that both in the sense of what that means for greater Israel, but for his own political survival. How do you see the Biden administration handling this conflict in Gaza? This foreign policy is hurting Biden more than anything else. Do you see Biden and his administration changing their policy, the way they're handling the situation in Gaza, or they're continuing the same way that they were doing all along? Well, practically, they're doing the same thing. Like, there's been no let up in the support for the United States to 
to Israel. Uh, you know, John Kirby, the national security spokesperson, just said it again yesterday. We're going to give Israel everything it needs to protect itself. By protect itself, it means carry out this genocide. Uh, the United States, it's been two and a half weeks since the International Court of Justice ruling. The United States has no has done nothing to respect that ruling. Uh, and in fact, it, it's done everything it can in many ways to contra contradict that ruling. Uh, one of the things that comes with this signing by, in the U.S. Senate of the $95 billion foreign assistance supplemental funding is a line uh, that prohibits the United States from funding UNRWA. And you see in the United States just continue to go along with the most ludicrous of Israeli claims uh, and also the most disastrous of Israeli claims. So the UNRWA funding, of course, uh, yeah. a, a chief among those, the Israelis uh, who have just, uh, uh, who just, whose entire character, that Israeli government's entire character is to lie. Lying is part of their war effort. Uh, I mean, like it's it just it, everything that the Israelis say cannot be taken with any degree of 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 honesty to it, of any degree of of, of integrity. You have to, on the face of what they're saying, disbelieve them at first, and then find reason later to believe them, because that's what they have shown themselves as. Everything they have said has made makes it so that any person with any degree of intellectual or moral honesty has to approach them that way. And so, in the case of the UNRWA funding. The Israelis say we have he, we have these allegations. Uh, Twelve members of UMRA out of thirty thousand were terrorists on October seventh, and the United States says, "Okay, we believe you. We're stopping our funding for UMRA, and we're getting these other dozen nations or so to go along with us." And you know, and then of course, well, no, we didn't look at it ourselves. We've not seen any evidence. Oh, you know, hey, you know, they they, they say to the uh, State Department, you know, these media outlets that have looked at it have said there is no evidence in it and you know the american government just continues to go along with it so the the backing of the united states for israel i think you can get into like real uh, real type of, of of speculation here uh real cynical uh speculation that is the idea uh to keep biden on the presidential campaign through the convention or at least through the primary, so that there are no delegates assigned to anyone other than Joe Biden, because uh, that's how the process works for nomination. So that, well, Marianne Williamson has dropped out. So Dean Phillips, who is the lone challenger, won't have anywhere near enough delegates to even make, even show up at the convention to uh, try and be nominated as the as a presidential candidate. Keep Biden on board long enough to ensure that doesn't happen. This way, the Democratic National Committee can choose their own successor can choose their own nominee right whoever that would be uh, and that person of course would not have to go through a primary process would not have to be criticized in any way from the left those types of things you can see that playing out as well then with israel where we just keep going along with everything biden takes the hit on it and then our new person who's running uh, against donald trump well that was on biden that's not on on, on this nominee I mean, so you can get real cynical in the ways you look at it, because how else are we going to look at this? I mean, the United States continues to support this genocide uh, actively, not just passively, but actively. It's shut down all efforts in the United Nations to to, to accomplish anything. It has just uh, completely ignored the, the International Court of Justice. And it is most importantly, it is sending, you know, Ten, uh, thousands and thousands of tons of weapons. And we, you know, we know that the United States has sent 25,000 tons of munitions to the, uh, to Israel. Uh, that's what they've said. That doesn't include, from where I've read this, that doesn't include the war stocks that were taken out of Israel that the United States had pre-positioned there. So there are many thousands of tons of war stocks that were already in Israel that were transferred to Israel by the United States, not including that figure. So you think about that 25,000 tons, well, the Hiroshima bomb was 15,000 tons, was 15 kilotons. So you're talking about what we have sent just by putting bombs on C-17s, we have sent one and a half times the explosive power of Hiroshima to Israel to deliver onto the Gazans.
I mean, so the role in this is just it, and and this the 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 unwillingness of the Americans uh, to accept the war crimes. I mean, you can have American spokespeople who are watching a video of people in Gaza being executed, uh, who are watching videos, reading testimonials, seeing reports of of the myriad of war crimes and so many war crimes, Nima. I don't even know where to begin. I, I mean, I'm so fluxum by it. I wouldn't even know which one to start with. Uh, you know, and they say, well, we don't have the evidence on that. Well, maybe there was, how do we know that was the Israelis that did that? I mean, so just the 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 amount of complicity, the role of the Americans in this genocide, and uh, you know, it, 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 it is is really startling. Uh, you know, and, and, and again, though, my prediction that we may see something worse than this or five or 10 years time based upon the trajectory on the trend that we've had seeing, right? We, we, Iraq was really bad. Uh, and then Syria, which was just, my God, the horror of Syria, but then Ukraine in a sense of just how sell, how, how senseless that was and how unwinnable it was and how that is a, a, a real proxy war where we're using the Ukrainians as pawns to be killed in this effort to bring down Russia. But then we see Gaza. And my God, a genocide that we are backing. I mean, so the trajectory, the trend on this, Nima, what comes next? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think the Americans, to get back to your question, I don't think the Americans are going to change on Israel. I certainly would like to, and I hope to God I'm wrong. But I think we see that the Americans continue this support through uh, this phase of the Israeli uh, genocide in Gaza. Uh, at some point, Gaza will be completely destroyed. Uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, numbers today, 70% of all homes in Gaza have been destroyed. 92% of all schools have been destroyed. 300 houses of worship have been destroyed. All the universities have been destroyed. All the bakeries have been destroyed, right? We know all the infrastructure has been destroyed. There are no water pipes or water sewage in many parts of, or sewage pipes in many parts of Gaza anymore because the Israelis have ripped them up. Let alone so, the ones that have been bombed, they ripped up. I mean, so at some point that destruction will be completed. And we're getting to that point because we are about to see the Israeli invasion of Rafa, which is the last place the Israelis have not gone into and raised directly. So is that the American intention? It's like, okay, we'll just kind of keep saying these things about how we're putting leverage on them and behind closed doors and words matter, you know, and then eventually it'll be done and we won't have to talk about it anymore. Uh, and then we could just claim that the disease and the famine that is occurring, the, the, the immiseration of the Gazans is just almost like an act of God. <laughs>